My name is Eric Friedlander. I'm chair of the U.S. National Committee for Mathematics. Our speaker is Sir Simon Donaldson. Simon wrote a spectacular PhD under Michael Atiyah, who I can't see anything but Michael is there, and Nigel Hitchin. This PhD was completed in 1983. Three years later, he got a Fields Medal. His work in smooth manifolds was remarkable. It was a stunning, not only were his results stunning, but his techniques have just revolutionized, and that word is overused tremendously, but it's revolutionized um, understanding of topology basically by using analytic methods, differential equations. This was only the beginning of Simon's contributions to understanding form manifolds. He's used gauge theory and many other techniques that are now absolutely standard in the subject. Among the many people who have followed Simon's lead are his 44 PhD students. Over the past 30 years, Simon has continued to expand and deepen his investigation of manifolds of dimension four, as well as dimension three, dimension seven, dimension eight. We may well hear about that. I don't know his title, by the way. Simon's remarkable research career has been at a very high level throughout. I've had the occasion to observe it recently, and it's remarkable the high standard he's met in his many years of mathematics. He's been recognized by a few prizes, the Crawford Prize, the King Faisal Prize, the Nemers Prize, the Shaw Prize, and the Breakthrough Prize. He, of course, got the Fields Medal. Please join me in welcoming Sir Simon Donaldson, who will speak to us today. Well, thank you, Eric, for your kind introduction. It's a great honor to be um, here giving this plenary lecture. And I'd like to thank the program committee and the organizers for inviting me. So the, the, the mathematics that we're going to discuss in this talk fits into the very general context of existence questions for differential geometric structures on manifolds. And this is a, a huge area. Slightly more specifically, the structures we're going to consider both inv all involve Riemannian metrics. They fit into the field of Riemannian geometry. And it's um, particularly appropriate to talk about this area here in Brazil uh, in view of the extraordinary development of differential geometry in Brazil over the past 60 years or so. And, and we remember especially the huge contribution of Manfredo del Carmo, uh, who died earlier this year, both to this development in Brazil and to differential geometry in the whole world more generally. So within this, um, this huge area of studying various structures, geometric structures on manifolds, uh, the plan for this talk is that we will discuss two uh, different topics. Part one, we will talk about <coughs> aspects of Kähler geometry in this context of complex manifolds. And part two, we will talk about 
uh, some more special uh, <clears throat> structures one can look at in uh, particular dimensions uh, here in the case of seven-dimensional manifolds. But before getting on to that, let's um, get going with a, a brief uh, review and recap of some basic notions in Riemannian geometry. That's to say our, our setting is a, an n-dimensional manifold, x, so it has um, around any point we can describe points in x in terms of n local coordinates, xi, and we're considering a Riemannian metric on our manifold. <coughs> That's to say, on each uh, tangent space, we have a, a positive definite quadratic form. It gives us a way of measuring the lengths of tangent vectors. <coughs> and in terms of our coordinates, this, um, this metric is specified by giving a, a matrix-valued function, gij, which determines this uh, quadratic form in terms of the canonical basis for the tangent space given by our coordinates. Mm. Now, given this uh, Riemannian metric, we can transfer uh, standard concepts from <coughs> geometry in Euclidean space to the setting of a manifold. We define uh, the length of a path by this well-known formula. Uh, you, 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 <coughs> at each point, we have the standard Pythagoras formula, which computes the uh, derivative of the tangent vector of our path. So the path is given by <coughs> giving the coordinates. Xi is a function of some parameter t. Uh, we take this quadratic form in the derivatives, take the square root, and integrate. That's the formula for the length of a path in a Riemannian manifold. And similarly, we can uh, generalize other concepts from Euclidean geometry, such as the angle between tangent vectors and so on. And particularly important in this talk will be the volume form uh, defined by a Riemannian metric. Going on to a, a slightly uh, deeper level in fundamental Riemannian geometry, uh, we have the important notion of geodesics, the paths which locally minimize length between two points, and um, most important here, the notion of parallel transport. If we have any path in a manifold, a Riemannian manifold, and we have a tangent vector at the initial point of this path, then there's a preferred way of transporting that tangent vector along the path in a way defined by the Riemannian metric. In terms of, if you would like to think in terms of the physics within the manifold, you would think of taking a, a, a gyroscope, you set it going, an axis pointing along that tangent vector, and carry your gyroscope along the path, and that will tell you how to transport your vector. So that's illustrated on this picture. We have our manifold, the green path, and a family of tangent vectors being parallel transported along the path. Now the other, the other thing uh, we want to recall in Riemannian geometry is the notion of curvature. And in fact, the only bit of the curvature that we'll be, uh, we need to talk about here is the Ricci curvature. And this is bound up with the, the volume form as we will see in various ways throughout the talk. Um, so uh, to give a definition, if we take a, a fixed point in our manifold, then there are standard coordinates, geodesic coordinates around that point in which the, the metric is, as it were, as close as possible to the Euclidean metric. <coughs> uh, then working in those coordinates, we take the, the volume form of the Riemannian metric, which is given just by the square root of the determinant of the matrix Gij, and we expand that in a, a Taylor series about our point. The leading term is Euclidean. The next term is a quadratic term, 
uh, the sum of rij xi xj. And then this rij is uh, the Ricci tensor at uh, our point P. So more invariantly, the Ricci tensor is the same kind of object as our, uh, our metric. It's um, in the symmetric square of the dual of the tangent vector, of the tangent space at each point. Now, the other thing we want to recall finally is that if we can take the, the trace of the Ricci tensor with respect to uh, the metric, um, then uh, that gives the scalar curvature. So that's the simplest, just a, a scalar invariant of a Riemannian manifold at a point. <clears throat> now the general um, slogan is that, uh, say that we have a manifold with positive Ricci curvature, then this makes volume smaller than in the Euclidean case. If we take, for example, the case of a sphere, which is positive Ricci curvature, then the, the case of the two-dimensional sphere, the area of a region in the sphere is somewhat smaller than the area of the corresponding region in um, <clears throat> a flat space, in a flat plane. So that completes our quick review, uh, and we can get on to uh, part one of our talk. We're discussing uh, the particular kind of Riemannian metrics called Kähler metrics. And these occur when our manifold is even dimension, and it is a, a complex manifold. So around each point, we have a preferred class of coordinate systems given by local complex coordinates. In terms of tangent vectors, we have on, on each tangent space, we have uh, the, a complex structure giving about i, <coughs> with i squared is minus 1. And uh, a Kähler metric, then, is given by a structure of a, of, a, of a metric G, as before, which is algebraically compatible with i. Uh, a way of saying that is that uh, G is the real part of a Hermitian form on this complex vector space. Uh, and, and the most important, that this uh, i, this complex action of the complex numbers on tangent vectors, commutes with parallel transport. We can take a tangent vector, multiply by i, and transport. We get the same answer as transporting and then multiplying by i. So that's a, that's a good way of explaining the condition in words. It's not a very, uh, on the face of it, a very easy condition to, to work with. Uh, there are many um, more practical equivalent uh, conditions. If we, uh, we can define a skew symmetric form, omega, just algebraically putting together the, 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 the metric, the quadratic form, and i in, in the standard way, and uh, the, the, the Kähler condition is just that this is a closed two-form. <clears throat> so one of the, one of the um, special features of Kähler metrics is that they're just determined, in a sense, by a single function rather than a big complicated matrix of functions, GIJs, in general Romanian geometry. Uh, there's a global version of this if we work with metrics in a fixed cohomology class, the cohomology class of this form. But um, let's just talk about the local version. That's to say, locally, in local coordinates, we can describe any Kähler metric by taking uh, a function, phi, a real-valued function, and then taking the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic derivatives in the, in the way indicated, d2 phi, dza, dz bar b. <clears throat> and this, this gives a matrix representing our emission form. The real part of that is the Riemannian metric. <clears throat> also, uh, for most cases of interest in, in this talk, we will, uh, we, the, the complex manifolds we will consider 
will be actually algebraic varieties, complex projective varieties, things defined by solutions of polynomial equations in the projective space. Uh, and this just corresponds to assuming that our cohomology class of the Kähler form is an integral class by standard theory. Well, the kind of questions about these Kähler metrics that we're interested in here go back to um, uh, the International Congress in 1954 in, in Amsterdam uh, with a, a contribution from Kalabi, which initiated uh, the general but a far-reaching study of existence questions for, as it were, optimal Kähler metrics. Initially, the main emphasis was on what's called Kähler-Einstein metrics. So these are ones where uh, the Ricci curvature is a multiple, a constant multiple, lambda times the metric tensor, G. So this is, as, as the name suggests, this is a, a, a Riemannian variant of the Einstein equations of general relativity. So these, these can only exist when there's <coughs> a certain condition on the, the, the underlying complex manifold uh, that its first Chern class should be what's called a positive, <coughs> negative, or, or zero. Uh, <coughs> the, 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 the three cases correspond to the sine of lambda. So I, I don't want to <coughs> spend time explaining this to standard theory, but if, for example, we consider a hypersurface in CPN of degree D, then the sine of, of the first Chern class is determined by the sine of n plus 1 minus d. When, when n is large, uh, we're in the negative case. We'd have to be in the negative case. When n is small, we're in the positive case. And there's a, a particular borderline case of degree n plus 1, where the first Chern class is 0. <coughs> so there are, there are many complex manifolds that satisfy this condition, but there are many that don't. For example, we could take the product of a manifold with positive root C1 with a manifold with negative C1. And uh, there's a, one can look at other kinds of equations which um, could be applied to more general classes of manifolds. Uh, the, 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 um, what's the most general equation we consider is what's called an extremal Kähler metric. Well, these include, in particular, uh, the class of constant scalar curvature Kähler metrics, where rather than saying that the Ricci curvature is constant in the sense of being a constant multiple of the metric form, we just say that the scalar curvature is constant. The general extremal condition, we won't write it out, it just says that the, the gradient of the scalar curvature is a holomorphic vector field. So there is a, a classical prototype or, or paradigm for these kind of existence questions, the case of Riemann surfaces, the case when the complex dimension is one. Then uh, it's a, a, a very easy consequence of the uniformization theorem that one has the, um, the simplest possible answer to this existence question. Any compact Riemann surface admits a metric of constant well, all notions of curvature are equivalent in this case, so you call it Gauss curvature or scalar curvature. And, and that, that is unique up to, in, particularly in, in the case of the sphere, up to the action of the holomorphic automorphisms. So we have the three cases of the, uh, the sphere, the round sphere of <clears throat> we're familiar with, constant curvature one. We have the case of uh, Riemann surfaces of genus zero, which are flat tori curvature zero, uh, and then the, the larger class of surfaces of genus two or more, which are all covered by the, um, the upper half space, and the, the Poincaré metric on the upper half space descends to give a metric of constant negative curvature on our Riemann surface. <coughs> so, Major progress on these questions raised by Kalabi came in the 1970s with work of Yao, 
who completely solved these existence questions for Kähler Einstein metrics in the uh, case when uh, lambda is zero or, or negative. This was also uh, <coughs> contemporaneous work of Aubin in the negative case. <coughs> and the, the statement follows exactly the pattern of what we saw in complex dimension one, just did the, essentially there is a solution and it's unique. Up to um, sort of <coughs> obvious um, <coughs> obvious action of automorphisms. The case when lambda is zero is uh, particularly important. This gives what's called kalabi our metrics, where the Ricci curvature vanishes, and that, the, the existence of such things, Riemannian, compact Riemannian manifolds, where the Ricci curvature vanishes, but they're not flat, the, whole, the full Riemann curvature tensor doesn't vanish. That is, uh, in some ways, quite surprising. The, Analogy with relativity might suggest that they shouldn't exist, uh, but they do, and that was one of the <coughs> striking consequences of Yao's work. So these things are called Kalabi Yao manifolds, uh, and they have important applications in string theory, as is well known. In, in other language, uh, this <coughs> having a metric with Ricci curvature zero. Uh, essentially corresponds to the reducing the structure group of the tangent bundle from the unitary group to the special unitary group. <clears throat> so the existence question for these Kähler-Einstein metrics comes down to uh, uh, the question of solving a, a partial differential equation, and this can be set up as a, a second order nonlinear equation uh, we take in, in local coordinates, expressed in terms of our local potential function phi, we take the, the, uh, this um, matrix of second derivatives, holomorphic and anti-second holomorphic derivatives, and take its determinant, and we set that equal to e to the minus lambda phi. So this is a matrix, uh, this is an equation of what's called complex Mont-Jampère type, uh, uh, because <coughs> This refers to the determinant of this complex Hessian appearing. And um, analogous to the real Mont-Jampère equation where we would take the, the determinant of the ordinary Hessian of a, of, of a function, uh, which in, uh, was in fact a, uh, <coughs> is the equation studied in a theory of um, optimal transport as uh, discussed in Professor Caffarelli's presentation yesterday. And um, <clears throat> so the, the main technique for proving these, for the, the, the technique that Yao used to prove his existence results was uh, PDE methods, <coughs> proving, establishing a priori estimates of various kinds for this potential function for solutions or solutions of a family of a natural family of equations that we could embed this equation into. And uh, it's important to say that the, the, the PDE techniques which are used in this complex geometry setting to study these equations are uh, intimately related to the, the similar techniques that are employed for studying, uh, say, the real Mont-Jampère equation in the setting of <coughs> optimal transport, meteorology, and so forth. So, since the 1970s, the work of Yao, the most of activity in this field has um, been two directions. One is the study of kähler einstein metrics in the positive case. This is what's called the case of Fano manifolds, as was just mentioned in um, um, another presentation yesterday. And on the other hand, uh, more generally, going beyond the Kähler-Einstein equation, studying uh, constant scalar curvature and extremal metrics. <clears throat> and in these cases, the existence problem is more complicated because it's been known for a long time that there are obstructions. So it's, it's not possible as just a straightforward existence theorem saying, yes, a solution exists. There are obstructions of very, various kinds. And uh, nowadays, we understand these in terms of stability criteria. <coughs> so 
So the, uh, I will not go into great detail, the, the, the notion of case stability, which turns out to be the relevant one, was introduced by Tian in 1997 and somewhat refined by myself later. Uh, I, I won't give a, a, a detailed technical definition, but this is a, a criterion, a numerical criterion, on degenerations of our complex manifold. So by gen degeneration, we mean a, a family of complex well, objects, say xt, parameterized by <coughs> a complex number t, so that for t not equal to zero, these are isomorphic to our original complex manifold x, but when t is zero, we get something potentially different. So this thing could be uh, possibly a singular variety or even a scheme. So the, um, the most basic example to have in mind would be where x is, say, a, a conic in the plane, and then we can degenerate that smooth conic to a singular conic given by a pair of lines, <clears throat> just by considering in affine coordinates an equation of the form xy equals t. For t non-zero, the solutions are all isomorphic, but when t is zero, we get something different. <clears throat> anyway, uh, the, the other key ingredient is that for such degenerations, call them script x, we can, uh, there's a, um, a numerical invariant called the Futaki invariant, and um, the, the, the condition of stability is that for all degenerations, the Futaki invariant should be positive. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> So we get, technically we get a, a, a range of different de definitions depending exactly what kind of the generations we allow. Uh, and, and also a, a slightly different, more algebraic defi definition was given by Zekalidi, in which one translates the geometry into, into algebra. And um, <clears throat> as it's well known in algebraic geometry, you can translate statements about spaces into statement about finitely generated algebras, and Zekalidi uh, then drops the finite generation condition. So then we, we come to um, on the main <coughs> lines of study in this area over the past 20 years or so, what's often called the YTD conjecture, that um, our, our manifold X, with its fixed cohomology class of Kähler metrics, admits a, a, a constant scalar curvature metric in this class if and only if it's um, K-stable. So in this uh, conjecture, uh, to be true, one should probably use um, Zekalidi's extended definition or, or something uh, equivalent to that. I should also say that this um, link, or conjectural link, between uh, stability, which is a purely uh, algebra geometric condition on our manifold, uh, and uh, the existence of this <coughs> differential geometric object, this fits into a, a, a very general pattern of results that have been developed since uh, the 1980s, uh, largely in the, the originally in the framework of studying Yang-Mills theory, connections on vector bundles, possibly bun vector bundles with extra structure, and a relation of that to the algebra geometric notion of stability for vector bundles. So this has been a, a very well-developed field uh, since the 1980s, in fact, <coughs> reaching back earlier than that to work of Narasim and Seshadri in the 1960s, uh, the, important work of Atiyah and Bott in the early 1980s, uh, <coughs> pointing out this kind of relationship. <coughs> so the, the, um, the Fano case of this YTT conjecture, which produces these Kähler-Einstein metrics with lambda positive, was established in, in 2013 by uh, uh, Chen Sun and myself, but this was discussed in the uh, last ICM in the, uh, the lecture of Zekalidi, so I'm not going to dwell on that now. Uh, since then, there are different proofs have come out, first of Data Zekalidi, 
a, a proof of using Ricci flow by Chen, Sun, and Wang, uh, and another proof of Berman, Books, and, and Johnson. Now, this is all for this question about Kähler Einstein metrics, and there have been many developments also in the area of constant scalar curvature metrics, uh, particularly uh, important very recent work of Chen and Cheng. So let's um, <coughs> try to give the flavor of some important ideas in this uh, existence theory. One set of ideas is the role of infinite dimensional geometry of the space of all Kähler metrics. So here we consider Kähler metrics in a fixed Kähler class, so they're essentially parameterized by a, a function, phi. And uh, the, of this space, there's a, uh, a, a, a geometry which is different to that's what one might first expect, what's called the, the Mabuchi metric is a, a Riemannian metric on this infinite dimensional space uh, defined by the formula that you see. The, uh, you take a, an infinitesimal variation, delta phi, the norm of that at a given point is given by the, the standard L2 norm, but defined using the volume form of the metric determined by phi. So it's, it's not obvious at all from the formula, but this turns out to make the space of Kähler metrics H formally into an in infinite dimensional symmetric space. It takes the suitable definition of a, of a standard symmetric space in Riemannian geometry, extend it to infinite dimensions, then uh, <coughs> this example satisfies that condition. <coughs> in fact, um, in, in the theory of symmetric spaces, the standard theory, they come in, in dual pairs. The positive, <coughs> a positive symmetric space is, has a dual, which is a negative symmetric space. And this space is uh, the negative dual of the symplectic diffeomorphism group of the manifold, which, as a group, uh, is a, has, a, has a metric of positive uh, curvature. Uh, so we have this. Um, <coughs> of interdimensional symmetric space of, of negative type. And then the other uh, key thing is that we have a functional, the, the Mabuchi functional on this, a real valued function, which is, I won't give the formula here, uh, but the, the critical points are exactly the constant scalar curvature metrics. We will, if time permits, we will see explicit formulae for these things in a, in a special case in a short while. So when these ideas were first conceived of, they might have seemed just like formal things that one could do, maybe not having much connection with hard existence problems. But um, one of the <coughs> striking things about the developments over the last 20 years is that indeed they do. Uh, one can take this infinite dimensional geometry uh, very seriously. So one question first is whether we take two points in our space where they can be joined by a geodesic. One can write down the equations for a geodesic, and it's a, a perfectly respectable partial differential equation. In fact, it's another form of complex mont ampere equation. But um, as going back to work of Chen at the beginning of the century, uh, one doesn't have a good existence theory for geodesics if one sticks in the smooth framework. But if one goes to, a, if one allows singularities where the function phi is only of class C11, so roughly speaking, the second derivatives might have discontinuities, then uh, Chen showed that there is a good existence theory for geodesics. Any two points could be joined by a geodesic segment. And an important uh, recent development along these lines is work of Berman and Benson, who showed that this Mabuchi functional is convex along these C11 geodesics. So this convexity is, if one sticks in the smooth situation, this is a, a rather routine, a simple calculation. Uh, the importance here is to extend it to this class of non-smooth geodesics where, on which the functional f is not even a priori 
even defined. So this is a, a, a deep sort of a input from analysis and what's called pluripotential theory, complex analysis. And the convexity becomes a, a powerful tool for improving existence and uniqueness results for these kind of metrics. For example, in the case of uniqueness, if you have a convex function, you know you can join two points by a geodesic, then that more or less immediately gives the uniqueness of the critical point. Modulo actions of the diffeomorphisms. So the, the general picture uh, then, which sort of gives credence to this uh, YTG conjecture, make, makes one think that it ought to be true, is that um, we, we can think of these degenerations of our manifold, which are a complex geometry notion, as points of an infinity on our, points of, on a sphere at infinity on our uh, infidimensional symmetric space H. If we, we can think of H as something like a, an infidimensional hyperbolic space, if we take a hyperbolic space thought of as a, the interior of a ball, is a standard way in which you add on this boundary sphere as points at infinity in your hyperbolic space. And more generally, one can do the same in any fine dimensional symmetric space of negative type. So the, the, the general idea is if we can't find a, a minimum of our Mabuchi functional H inside the space of Kähler metrics, then uh, we can detect this by the behavior at points of infinity, and in particular, the points of infinity of the kind which correspond to de degenerations. Now this sort of vague but heuristic idea can, um, well, I can think of many technical developments over many years as giving, making this heuristic idea precise, moving towards making this precise. So that, for example, the definition of Zeccolidi, uh, one can th that brings in more points at infinity, essentially. Glasgow wants a larger class of points at infinity. So this is the schematic picture. We have a blue, let's get that. This is a, 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 a blue geodesic segment joining two Kähler metrics. Uh, if, supposing, the idea is that supposing we uh, try to minimize, say, our Mabuchi functional, giving a family, say, caused by the green path, if that doesn't converge inside the space of metrics, then it should wander off to infinity somewhere, and then we should look at that point of infinity, and the fact that, as it were, we're decreasing the Mabuchi functional as we go towards there, that's precisely the sign of this Futaki invariant. That's the general idea. So the other, uh, another important circle of ideas that comes in is uh, somewhat different, coming from the theory of Riemannian convergence theory. So this is a, a big area in Riemannian geometry, developed by many people, notably uh, going back to Gromov and then Chiga and Kolding. Uh, if, for example, we consider a sequence of Riemannian manifolds with uh, fixed volume bound on the diameter and control of the Ricci curvature, say a bounded, bounded Ricci curvature, all such a thing, a fixed bound, then a statement is that there is a, a subsequence so that these Romanian manifolds converge in what's called the gromov hausdorff sense. This is a, a general notion of convergence of metric spaces to some metric space, to some metric space as a limit. That's in itself not too difficult, uh, but much uh, deeper, the work of Cheever and Kolding studies the structure of this gromov hausdorff limit and shows that there's an open, dense, rec regular set on which it's a, a manifold with a, a metric, or in fact, a, a C1 alpha Riemannian metric. And then we have a, a closed, lower dimensional singular set, potentially. Another <coughs> important idea in this cheever kolding theory is that, that there are are called tangent cones at points of the singular set. We may have a singular point, but if we take a suitable sequence of rescalings of the manifold about the singular point, then we converge to some cone. So this theory becomes an important tool for proving existence results in the, in the 
the Kähler-Einstein situation via various uh, continuity methods or uh, in the work of, uh, in the version of the proof of Chen, Wang, and Sun, the, the Ricci flow. Well, that, that's actually the, technically the most difficult, but maybe the easiest to explain uh, so the general idea here, that you, you, you follow the Ricci flow, <coughs> um, prove a co corresponding results for this, this, the Ricci flow rather than for these Marinian manifolds. So if you don't converge to a point inside your space of Kähler metrics, then you do converge to something via this convergence theory. Uh, and then using this, developing this theory and the interaction with the complex geometry, you show that, that something, which is maybe is a singular space, but nevertheless is an algebraic variety, which then becomes the, the central fiber in your degeneration, rough, slightly simplifying. So roughly speaking, you get this singular limit, and then you construct a degeneration to that singular limit in the complex algebraic sense, and then show that that would contradict stability. So the, the existence uh, theory in this setup is well developed. Um, but perhaps more interesting than just uh, the existence statements by themselves is the great flowering of interactions between the complex geometry, which here we mean really complex algebraic geometry, and the Riemannian metric geometry, which um, are sort of come out of this circle of ideas, motiva motivated by work on this existence theorem. And um, as we'll see, m many of these involve or notions of volumes in different ways, where in the algebraic geometry situation, volume has to do with the growth of spaces of dimensions of spaces of holomorphic functions or holomorphic sections. So um, um, a beautiful example of this is a result of Fujita, which says that projective space maximizes volume. So if we consider uh, a Kähler-Einstein metric, and we normalize so the Ricci is equal to G, then um, the statement is that the volume under that condition is at most this explicit constant, which is precisely the thing you have if you take the standard metric on the complex projective space. Actually, there's a typo. M here should be X. So this is a purely differential geometric statement and is a very natural one. If we dropped the Kähler condition, then a standard comparison theorem in Riemannian geometry would say we had the corresponding inequality, but on the right-hand side, we would get the volume of the sphere of the appropriate size. So it's very natural to say, if we impose the Kähler condition, what is the, what is the um, how do we maximize the volume? But while it's a purely differential geometric statement, the proof of Fujita is algebra geometric using the translating this into a statement about k-stable Fano manifolds. Another direction um, pursuing this uh, chiga colding theory, we have, supposing we take, say, a, 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 a sequence of Kähler-Einstein metrics that has a, a gromov hausdorff limit, which one can show is a, actually a complex algebraic variety. And then the question comes, how can, can one describe the chiga colding tangent cone, which is a part of this metric theory, in terms of the algebraic geometry of this variety? So there have been many developments on this in the last few years. One can um, define a valuation, what's a suitable algebraic geometric gadget on the, the local ring of holomorphic functions around our point uh, by the formula shown. This is essentially saying that any, I mean, the, see, one needs to prove that this formula is well-defined, right? this limit exists. And that's essentially saying that any function has a well-defined order of vanishing. And that order of vanishing defines evaluation. So this was uh, considered in work with uh, Song Sun. And uh, we showed that, well, slightly simplifying, if we're given this valuation, then one can determine the tangent cone from that. Then the question arises of how is this valuation determined 
entirely algebra geometrically, not referring to the differential geometry. So in this formula, because we're looking at the, the maximal value of the function over a ball of radius r, uh, that brings in the, the, the differential geometry. But um, there is, it turns out, as has been shown by work of Li and Liu and Li Wang and Xu very recently, uh, a purely algebra geometric characterization of this, again via a kind of a volume maximization condition. So the upshot is that one gets a completely algebra geometric description of these tangent cones. And the related results of, of Hein and Sun uh, <coughs> achieving the same end for many kinds of singularities. <coughs> Another direction is uh, the work on moduli spaces of algebraic varieties. Um, the, the, the existence of these Kähler-Einstein metrics means that if we, we immediately get um, the existence of a moduli space of K-stable Fano manifolds as a uh, separated space, like a Hausdorff space. Uh, <clears throat> then, so this, this is, gives an important contribution to uh, the algebraic geometry of moduli spaces. And we can also go on to consider the question of compactifying these moduli spaces using this gromov hausdorff convergence gives natural compactifications, which can be compared with uh, algebra geometric compactifications in which one allows singularities of a certain kind. And again, there's been a lot of activity in this area, which also extends into the case of kalabi yau manifolds and um, <coughs> the manifolds of general type, where um, these same kind of questions arise in studying moduli spaces. <coughs> and all of this can be seen as a, a generalization of the, the, the Deline Mumford theory of uh, compactified moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces, which can be studied either algebra geometrically or in terms of hyperbolic metrics, uh, as we discussed in the, the classical situation. So, the, more on these developments, more, more details about this um, would be you could hear about it in the lecture of Song Sun. It, uh, in this uh, Congress. <clears throat> so time is running slightly short. So I think, I, I think I'm going to miss that short section to get on to part two of my talk. I was hoping to talk more about this, the work of Chen, uh, Chen and Cheng uh, very recently, but in the, <clears throat> in the, um, the, the written version of the talk will contain some <coughs> discussion of that. But let me press on to uh, the last part of the talk in which we look at this other area of <coughs> exceptional holonomy. So here again, there's a connection between differential geometry and algebra. But now the algebra is that of speaking number systems. So we know we have the real numbers and the complex numbers. Uh, it's natural to ask. What are the possible number systems? And uh, the famous answer is there are just four. If we, uh, technically, if we're looking at what's called norm division algebras, then there are just four of those, the reals, the complexes, the four-dimensional quaternions, and then one more, the eight-dimensional octonions. So the, the, the part of the structure that we need to emphasize is the cross product that one gets on the imaginary octonian. So this is on, on R7. There's a way to write down a cross product, which um, is analogous in many ways to the familiar cross product of vectors in R3. And this is very specific. And 3 and 7 are the only dimensions in which such a, a cross product exists, satisfying suitable axioms. But the automorphisms of R7 with this cross product uh, it gives the, um, the exceptional Lie group, G2, 14 dimensional Lie group. Now, the, the differential geometric structure we're going to consider is what's called a, a torsion free G2 structure. It consists of a seven dimensional manifold, a Riemannian metric, a cross product, 
so that the, the metric and the cross product are algebraically compatible in a standard way, and again, that the cross product commutes with parallel transport. We can take two vectors and their product and transport that. It's the same as transporting the vectors and then taking their product. <coughs> so these manifolds, um, uh, one of the striking things about them is again that they again uh, have uh, metrics with Ricci curvature zero. And just as calabi our manifolds are important in string theory in physics, these are important in what's called M theory. And again, there's a, um, there's a more practical characterization of this condition, uh, rather than thinking about parallel transport, in terms of a differential form, in this case of a three form, uh, which you form by using the metric and the cross product. Uh, <coughs> one can recover the cross product from this, this um, a suitable kind of positive three form. And then the, the condition is that this three form is closed and also co-closed with respect to the Riemannian metric. So it becomes quite a straightforward condition to write down in terms of exterior forms. This is a picture of the condition again of parallel transport along the green curve commutes with this cross product on tangent vectors. So this area really goes back to a similar period as the work of Calabi, this in this case work of Berger in the 1950s, uh, which classified, speaking, all the holonomy groups of Riemannian manifolds, and the case of G2 was one on Berger's list. But modern work um, begins with um, the 1980s with uh, work of Robert Bryant, which featured in the ICM 1986, showing that there are there's at least local examples of these special Riemannian metrics. Then, in the following decade, uh, important work of Joyce initiated the global theory, showing that there are compact examples. And again, this featured in 90, ITM in 1998. So the kind of general questions one interested in is, if we take a seven-manifold, does it have one of these structures? And if it has one, what, is the what can we say about the moduli space of all of such structures? So these questions are easy to ask, uh, but not so easy to answer. Very, in general, this area of studying these metrics of exceptional holonomy is um, relatively new, uh, not, not as compared, for example, to Kähler geometry. It's been developed to a very sophisticated level over half a century. Uh, so in this area, by contrast, um, most questions one can ask, not very much is known about. One thing it's known in, in the, these moduli spaces is a, a good local theory, but they, the moduli space is locally modeled on the three-dimensional cohomology of the manifold via the period map, which takes the cohomology class of our three form. So again, I think I'll skip over to get to the last part of the talk. <clears throat> so it may not be obvious from the definition, but there are many connections between the study of these manifolds of exceptional holonomy and uh, the better understood questions in Kähler geometry in the same vein as the first part of the talk. So to give a, in a sense, rather elementary, almost trivial example of this, let's just take a kalabi yau threefold. So a three-dimensional complex manifold with a, a kalabi yau metric. So that means that there's a, a, a two-form, which is parallel, I preserved by parallel transport, and also a, a, three a holomorphic three-form, lo locally, the real part of dz1, dz2, dz3, uh, not sorry, dz1, dz2, dz3 in, in, in local coordinates, then we can write down a three-form on the product of our six-manifold with a circle in by taking the real part of the holomorphic form plus omega times dt, where t is the coordinate on the circle. And this gives uh, that product a, one of these torsion-free G2 structures. Another point of view, SU3, the structure group of our Calabi Yad threefold, is a subgroup of G2. 
So this by itself is not very interesting because we're just getting reducible examples. It seems a bit trivial. But as we'll see, uh, a variant of that can produce many very interesting examples. So in fact, this is, this is what's called the twisted connected sum construction. And alongside the original construction used by Joyce, uh, that really th these are the only two known ways of producing uh, compact examples of these kind of manifolds. So this um, twisted connected sum idea goes back to Kovalev, the early part of the century, but was very significantly extended recently by Corsi and, and collaborators, <coughs> uh, making it a, an even more powerful tool in the area. So let me just describe, let's take the last five minutes to describe this construction and how it connects with questions in Kähler geometry. So we start with a, a complex threefold with a, a Lefschetz vibration. That's to say, we have a map to the complex projective line or Riemann sphere, S2, whose generic fiber is a, a complex K3 surface, so a, a four-dimensional, four-real-dimensional manifold. But um, we have a fine number of singular points at which our K3 surface acquires the simplest kind of double point singularities. So um, <coughs> let's now cut out a, a neighborhood of a small tubular neighborhood of some smooth fiber. So if we restrict to that, we get a vibration of uh, this complement, W, over the disk, again with the same number of these singular fibers. And so now take a product with a circle. So now we've got this W times S1, a seven manifold, fibering over the disk times S1. But now we have critical values on which the fiber becomes singular, now make up a finite number of circles, because we've just taken the previous situation and multiplied by a circle. So I, I'm just going to begin just by doing a, a topological description of what's going on. There's a standard description of the three sphere as the union of a pair of solid tori. We take one solid torus, then the, the complement in the three in R3 add on the point of infinity is another solid torus. So we imagine we have a pair of the, the called the building blocks as described before. Over each solid torus, we have this seven manifold with these fibered, and then we can glue these solid tori together to make a three sphere and glue the seven manifolds together to make a compact seven manifold with a map down to the, the three sphere. So this is just a topological level, which we, um, we call these Kovalev-Lefschetz -Lef -Lef vibrations. Let's give a picture. This is a schematic topological picture of the three sphere. We have a family of blue circles from one from the W1, say, just two blue circles as drawn, a family of red circles which link the blue circles going around the other way. Over the three sphere, we have this seven manifold fibering over it. Away from the circles, the fiber is a smooth four manifold, topologically a K3 surface, but then we acquire these ordinary double point singularities when we um, come to the, <coughs> over this link of circles. So this um, twisted connected sum construction produces, in, in, in favorable situations, um, one of these G2 holonomy structures on such a manifold. And what are the main ingredients of that? First of all, um, <coughs> there's a general existence theorem of uh, Tian and Yao, extending Yao's result. Uh, which constructs complete Calabi Yau metrics on certain non-compact manifolds formed by taking a, a compact manifold and removing a divisor. So and refinements of that can be applied in our situation to get a Calabi Yau metric on the complement of a fiber in W, which has a cylindrical end. It's modeled, the end is modeled on the product of a K3 surface and a circle and the real numbers. 
So we can take the product of the circle with that, and then we get one of these reducible G2 structures on that product, as we explained a few slides back. So that object by itself is not very interesting, because it's just a product with a circle of something we knew about, roughly speaking, for many years. <laughs> but then the next thing to do is to take a pair of these things. So we take another setup with a W2. And then we have two things with these cylindrical ends. And the, 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 the key ingredient in the cylindrical ends is a, is a K3 surface with, in fact, a, a Calabi hour metric on the K3 surface. And then there's a certain matching problem that we, we don't have time to describe in detail, but saying, can we construct these two things, W1 and W2, so that the K3 surfaces match up? In fact, this involves a, a subtlety of what has to perform what's called a hypercalar rotation. The uh, a K3 surface has the special feature that it has a hypercalar structure, a whole, they have an action of the quaternions on the tangent space. So there's a whole family of complex structures. And the obvious complex structures on these things don't match up, but the hypercalar rotated ones do. So this is a bit uh, too technical to explain in detail. But the point is that there's an enormous amount known about K3 surfaces. This is a complete description of the Calabi of the moduli space to what's called the Torelli theorem. And then this matching problem can be solved in many situations, uh, sometimes involving sophisticated lattice theoretic questions, involving questions about whether one can embed the, the cohomology of your Fano manifold in the cohomology of a K3 surface respecting the integer lattices. <coughs> so, but this relies on very sophisticated um, algebraic geometry. The next, finally, two, once we have these two things, we have these two manifolds with cylindrical ends, and the ends match up, so we can sort of glue them together. We don't get, in an obvious way, an exact solution to our equation, but we get an approximate solution. And then one uses gluing techniques to slightly deform that using an implicit function theorem type result to construct a genuine uh, G2 structure. So although the two pieces have circle actions, because of this way we interchange the circle actions when we do this gluing together the two solid tori, there's no global circle action. And one produces genuine interesting um, examples. So this is a kind of metric picture of the same thing. We have these two things with cylindrical ends, and we glue them together to make a long cigar-like object where the, the, once the neck is sufficiently long. Let's go. I've finished my time. I'll just do this one more slide. Um, so this, as I say, this construction has been around for some years, but it has been developed um, in various, well, many ways we don't have time to go into uh, in the last few years. Uh, giving sort of new life to this um, subject. Uh, in particular, by refining the construction and solving this matching problem in a uh, case of increasing sophistication, uh, various interesting phenomena can be shown. As I've just mentioned work of Crowley and Nordstrom, which show that one can construct seven manifolds, x1 and x2, both of which carry these same torsion-free G2 structures, which are homeomorphic, but not diffeomorphic. So remember the famous existence of, of Milner constructing exotic st smooth structures on the seven sphere. This x1 and x2 would differ by a connected sum with one of Milner's exotic spheres. Well, I'm out of time, but I hope I show that there's this other area of involving these special structures in seven dimensions, which interacts with the Kähler geometry been extensively developed over many, many years, uh, but also with other subjects such as topology of manifolds, smooth structures, and many other things. And I expect there'll be other developments in this area to be reported on in ICMs in the future. Thank you.